Okay. Uh, actually, I anticipated Tim, and I decided not to introduce new material. But basically, my title is not this one. My, my true title is this one. Some basic notion related to thermodynamics, convergence to equilibrium, and entropy that have been already been discussed in the past days and even today. So since tomorrow there is a break, we have been going through very difficult subjects, and I took the liberty of just focusing on some of the points that have been already presented, maybe from a different light. Now I start very far, very, very far in the fifth century before Christ. And uh, it's what I usually do in my co class. So I like always to start with Thales, Anaximandra, Anaximenes. Actually more with Thales and Anaximenes. And I leave an, an, Anaximandra. If somebody is interested in, should read the book of Rovelli that he just published. Why? <clears throat> What's the point? The point is that I want to relate the beginning of science, in the way in which we understand it today, with what we are doing now. And uh, it's amazing how that project that started so long time ago is basically still the same. It's following the same lines. The, the, the great contribution of Thales is that the world around us is something that can be understood if one only takes the trouble of observe this properly. I'm following Schrodinger. It's a beautiful book that I recommend to everybody, The Nature and the Greeks. All matter of which a world consists has, with all its infinite variety, yet so much in common, that it must be intrinsically the same stuff, and that is Thales. And then comes Anaximenes. The most obvious transformation of matter are rarefactions and condensations. Every kind of matter can be transformed into the solid, fluid, or ga <coughs> gas state in suitable circumstances. And Anaximenes chose the air. It is incredible, I mean, from the little we know what he did, how we could have uh, a theory of uh, fog, of rain, that is not so far from what we have today. And was an incredible leap of reason because he was thinking that uh, liquid, water, the same substance than the gas, the vapor, which is, I mean, why I say it's a big leap? Because, I mean, the order of magnitude of, of, of change of the volume is over the thousand, two thousand. So it was a very great guess. And, uh, and now <coughs> Democritus, <coughs> went in the same tradition. He had a problem to solve. How could be, how could be the best explanation for the fact that uh, matter remain unchanged, water remain unchanged when it goes from solid to liquid to liquid to vapor? If it is actually, and then the idea is that, how can I explain that? Yeah, if it is actually composed of very, many, many small bodies, then I can account for the refraction and compression. These two words you find in all the history of science. You, you find them in Galileo. Galileo had uh, this pro the same deep problem, how to explain bodies, matter. And he went back to the old idea of an atoms and rarefaction and compression as can be explained in terms of atomic hypothesis. Now, that's a quote that, uh, now I, let's jump 2,000 years in the future, more, more than 2,000. And that is uh, uh, <coughs> a quote from Feynman, and uh, that you have, uh, I'm sure you already read. <coughs> so, <coughs> if uh, in some cataclysm, all the of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed, and only one sentence passed it on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? I believe it is the atomic hypothesis that all things are made of atoms. Little particles that move around in perpetual motion 
attracting each other when we are very close, when they're a little distance apart, by repelling upon being squeezed into one another. In the centers, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world. It's just a little imagination and thinking are applied. Because the two main problems of statistical mechanics have somehow a root, one has a root in antiquity, because what I call the Anaximenes Democritus problem is to explain phase transitions, is to explain how come that uh, uh, <coughs> water can be in, uh, in the solid state, in the liquid state, in the gas state. And uh, and the other one is the one that we are discussing here. At least entropy is very much related to this problem. How irreversible macroscopic behavior is explained by the reversible motion of the atoms. Now here we need Newton because we need the mechanics describing the motion of atom which is reversible. At the same time we know that the macroscopic world around us has irreversible behavior. So there is a problem. There is something to be explained. And uh, both problems were tackled in the middle of the uh, 19th century. And these are the two great problems of statistical and mechanics, and we are still, uh, people are still working a lot on them. So, and for both problems, entropy plays a crucial role. Now, to elaborate why entropy plays a crucial role, I want to review a little bit thermodynamics. We already heard the first day a lecture on thermodynamics, so I will be very brief. I try to summarize what has been said in a different way. And uh, that's the book, the book of Cullen, is the book that I use when I teach statistical mechanics. And at the beginning of the course, I have to give a review of thermodynamics. And uh, Cullen <coughs> has a nice way of describing thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of a restriction on the possible properties of matter that follow from the symmetry properties of the fundamental laws of physics. I think it's good what Cullen says, and, uh, and we should detach ourselves from the origin of thermodynamics that to do with heat engines, with uh, something very concrete. The core of thermodynamics is just physics, and this, of course, was realized by Clausius that was able to transform the work of Carnot in, uh, in something that was directly relevant to physics of <coughs> what there is in the world. But uh, uh, it is important to relate thermodynamics to the basic symmetry properties of the fundamental laws because uh, a relation is there is a relation with the conservation laws. I mean, the, the thermodynamics sy symmetry, uh, symmetry properties are related to conservation laws, and thermodynamics is uh, <coughs> described in the macroscopic ma manifestations of conservation laws. Now, there are various ways of uh, presenting what is the basic problem of thermodynamics. I choose this one. Uh, before I say that one should free, we, we should free ourselves from the concrete engineering applications and try to understand thermodynamics uh, in a very general terms. Now, I don't follow too much that advice because I free myself now in the presentation from heat engines, but I still think of uh, a system which is contained in a box, and uh, this may not be the best way to formulate more generally thermodynamics according to the principle 
of Callan that was in the slide before, especially if uh, we want to describe a thermodynamic behavior of matter in an unbounded regions of space, like galaxies, stars, cluster of galaxies. If we choose a vessel and we put our system in a vessel, we have a description in which the conserved quantity are, so I put here, what you have here, you have a, a, a box divided into two, this is a sliding piston, and uh, I think of a fluid, of a simple fluid, and um, the variable describing the fluid of this size, the energy volume and the number of particles, the same on side B, and uh, here the conservation of laws are the total energy is constant, that means that the boundary of a vessel is <coughs> made of uh, some uh, material that doesn't let heat flow in, it's rigid, so there is no work on the environment. So the sum of the energies is constant, so it's constant the sum of the volume, and is constant the sum of the number of particles. Now, one may characterize the basic problem of thermodynamics in saying, oh, suppose that I start putting this piston somewhere, hmm, some position. And then uh, I let it go. No, first I put it somewhere, and then I let it go, and I ask, what is the final state of the system? It turns out that if I can solve this problem, I can solve basically all problems of thermodynamics. And I go back to the old formulation in terms of heat engines by putting here, I don't know, to, to, <coughs> to, to uh, connect some, some with some device, uh, I mean the, the piston to, 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 to a device raising some weight and so on. But I don't want to do that. Now there is no extra work done. Now, the final equilibrium state given, you see, the <coughs> another confusing fact about thermodynamics is that uh, there are a lot of variables. One never knows which one should use. Now I'm using what they're called extensive variables, which are directly associated to what is conserved in the process. Now, <coughs> how <coughs> could you get uh, an answer to that? Now, usually, equilibrium, various sort of equilibrium are characterized as a minimum pro <coughs> when a property of the system reaches a minimum, or if you just put a, si a negative sign in front, when the, <coughs> this new quantity with a minus sign reach a maximum. And so the idea is to try the same here. And uh, Indeed, it's like that. There is a property of physical system that reach its maximum at equilibrium, and that is entropy. And if you look at minus en the entropy, that means the H function that was mentioned in the past days, then we go to a minimum. And entropy is a function of extensive variables. Now, <coughs> which property should entropy have? Okay, first one, given a a system, always thinking of a fluid, so a fluid described by energy, volume, and number of particles. The entropy is a function of these extensive variables. I say that uh, entropy is uh, important. Why is it important? Because if you know that function, you know you have all the thermodynamic information about <coughs> your system. Nothing else is missing. I mean, that function contain what is called the equation of state, the mechanical equation of state, the all, the all information that usually is presented in uh, using different equations, like uh, for, for, for a f ideal gas, P, P times V equal nRT, and then you add uh, an equation for the energy. Okay, these two equations are, can be easily deduced by that function. Now, which property should have should be additive of our subsystems. If you have uh, this system and this system, A and B, 
the total entropy is the sum of the entropy of system A and system B. As to be a monotonically increasing function of E, and uh, has to be a concave function of E, V, and N. Now, my picture I realize after below is, is picturing a convex function, but uh, usually in real life I have difficulty in distinguishing left from right and much more con concavity from convexity. Okay, so the S function, the entropy is like that, just the opposite what I draw. Now, these four conditions character <coughs> establish that they guarantee that a maximization problem uh, as a solution. So you may determine the equilibrium states by maximizing. If you have A and B of a slide before, you maximize this function. And that is telling you what are the conditions that are characterizing the final equilibrium state. What are the equilibrium conditions? The equilibrium conditions are same temperature, same pressure, and forget about that. This is chemical potential. That is, <coughs> is when, when the, the moving piston has, uh, can let matter flow through it, but forget that. Forget even pressure, they focus on temperature. Now, in this approach, you get you <coughs> what uh, temperature, pressure, chemical potential are, they are just derivative of the S function, of the entropy function. And uh, how do you get this condition? Simply using the rule that uh, they teach you at the beginning of a calculus course, namely how, what is the necessary condition for the maximum is that the uh, derivative should be zero. So this is nothing more than the condition of uh, finding the maximum of that function. Right, and this is uh, exactly, that's why you need. So you need that uh, uh, a condition on the sort of function in such a way that that is a maximum, has to be a concave function. And that corresponds physically to stability. Your system is a physically sta stable system. If it w this condition would be violated, your system will be unstable, it could be a transfer of continuous transfer of energy from one part of the system to another part, and the system will never reach equilibrium. So these are the minimal condition for obtaining an equilibrium, and then it's all you need about entropy. And uh, <coughs> often in the books you find uh, uh, other functions, but these are like the free energy or uh, the Landau potential, there is no chalk, no, here. Okay, so th this is for instance, the, uh, in chemistry, people like to work with this quantity. But uh, it's a mathematical fact that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the entropy and its functions, the F, the, the Gibbs potential, and the and the information that we have about, so in practice, when you are working in, in an environment at constant pressure and uh, constant temperature, it's useful to use not S, but to use G, which is uh, similar to is U plus PG minus Gs. But don't worry about the symbols. I want to say that uh, in chemistry, we have a lot of information for the various substances about G, but as soon as you know G, the G function, you know the S function. So this, uh, that's why is the entropy is not just a, a thermodynamic variable, it's the thermodynamic variable. If you know the entropy, you know everything. And uh, if experiment gave you information about G or F, then you can just go back by an invertible transformation to S. So S Knowing S as a function of extensive variable means to know all the thermodynamic property of the body. Now, 
in the past days, there were lectures on the relation between microscopic and macroscopic. Here I want to review also a little bit about that. Uh, the microscopic description, as you learn, is given, at least in the classical approximation, by specifying the positions and the velocity or the momentum of uh, n particles that form your system. And, uh, and then if the system is isolated, like the system that we had before, then the microscopic motion takes place on the surface of constant energy. Now, this picture is not so good because you learn from the lecture of Shelley that uh, if this represents phase space, this region is enormously big. You basically, something a little bit more realistic will be something like that. And uh, these are regions in phase space that describe different macro state. A macro state is uh, the set of phase points that have, uh, they look similar, look the same macroscopically. And uh, now, which variable are used to give uh, a, macro <coughs> a macroscopic description? Okay, this picture should be, okay, something is missing, I don't know why, in the, in the transfer in the file, but here there was a picture of uh, a distribution of points in the single particle phase space. That means uh, uh, the position, the velocity of a single particle. And uh, I wanted to convey, but it's missing. There are missing a lot of points here. And uh, to convey that uh, a single point in uh, phase space can be represented as a, a set, a huge set of points in uh, a single particle space. And the distribution function corresponds to a coarse grain description. That means you just uh, divide into cells, the physical space, the velocity space, and just to give uh, how many particles there are in each cell. This is the kinetic description. It's not the only des description you can uh, have. You can have other description. Depends just on the, on the material. Uh, other very <coughs> microscopic variables that are very useful in practice are variable in which you, so the macro states, is characterized by now dividing physical space into cell, only physical space, and uh, describing the state of the system, giving the number of particles that are in each cell, the momentum in each cell, which is the sum of the momenta of all the particles that are in the cell, and the energy. And uh, again, you have uh, uh, a region of phase space which correspond to, for each values of n, p, and e, for each shell, so from j running from alpha from 1 to j, you have uh, a macro state. And this is, uh, is good for a fluid that is uh, not so, <coughs> let's say, like water, which is not a, a dilute gas. Now, you already heard that, uh, the <coughs> and add on the blackboard, the definition of Boltzmann entropy. Let's repeat it. I mean, given a macro state, now you have a, a region in phase space corresponding to that macro state. Macro state. These two lines mean take the volume, the Uwil volume, the Lebesgue volume. And now you have uh, the entropy of that macro state. The Boltzmann entropy is below and is at any given time in phase space. 
the system is in some macro state, X is the point representing the system is somewhere. And so given X, you have a macro state to which X belongs. And that is the Boltzmann entropy. So it's a entropy defined for a single point in phase space. Now, if I have to, we, we had discussions about Gibbs and uh, Boltzmann. Now, if we want to just pin down what is the, the difference between the two, is, uh, of course, at equilibrium. At equilibrium is a very, is a difference which is not actually a serious difference. Why? Because According to Gibbs, you just take the volume of a full energy source. And now, according to Boltzmann, you take the volume of the region of phase space, which correspond to equilibrium, which the phase point, the single phase point, have equilibrium properties. For instance, in the kinetic description, you have, a, you have your point U1, Un, U1. Let's say V1, uh, let's simplify that. V1, velocity is the same. I mean, all the masses are equal for simplicity. Yeah. Now, given this point, you have a a distribution of points in the velocity space and in the position space. Take just a, a component of velocity, let's say along x. Now, if you do the usual partition into small cells, this the picture will be, the corresponding distribution will be an histogram, which is very well approximated by a Maxwellian, the Maxwell distribution that you saw yesterday on the blackboard. So if this is an equilibrium point, so because yesterday remember somebody asked, what does it mean to be an equilibrium point? The point has a velocity distribution, that means the histogram that you construct out of a V1, Vn, which is given by a Maxwellian. Just a second, I will comment on that. I went, uh, I, I will. You didn't see exactly that one. I want to say that when you went, once you see that, the, the difference at this level is just that. In one case, this will be the entropy in the microcanonical ensemble. The Gibbs entropy in the microcanonical ensemble. But then, uh, when you go to the canonical ensemble, again by a, by a transformation, you get the form of the Duane on the blackboard. But you get that formula starting from this function. That's, that's why I insist, if you want to understand what is the real difference, is just the fact that uh, in one case, this is a function of a point, x. If a point is in equilibrium, that means belongs to uh, this region, we'll have uh, a distribution, an histogram Ma Maxwellian-like, but it's not a general theorem, like Shelley says, but for the system that we are able to control, we have uh, experience that this is true. That means uh, there is uh, basically no difference. I mean, they are almost equal. And so these two quantities are equal. As soon as you have this quantity, when you, when, when you learn uh, statistical mechanics in uh, 
physics course, they first give you this quantity for equilibrium. And then, uh, and then they apply that entropy to a large system containing a system which is still large but smaller than that one. And when uh, you uh, describe a small system, you get the canonical distribution that Wayne was talking about. But the origin of a difference is just lie in this very simple fashion. That means basically that in the Gibbs, you lose information about the point. You get the feeling, you have the impression that uh, entropy is a, a property of a measure. Now, I don't, will not go into the details because I say, what is our experience? Our experience is with simple systems like uh, a dilute gas and uh, with models. Now, I don't have time um, to go through the models that I decided to, I, I choose two models, but, <clears throat> but the models are good because uh, give you a feeling that the things may work in the right ways, not just talk. And uh, this is a model that Ehrenfest was a pupil of Boltzmann and uh, trying to explain Boltzmann's ideas, he invented a simple model. I will not go into the details of the model, but it's something that you can go to a book, uh, to Wikipedia, you know, and just learn it, and there you see that everything works fine. You can do all the analysis analytically. Now, you have uh, this fixture system You have n balls, and uh, each ball has a number, let's say from 1 to 100. Well, <clears throat> then, of course, we're interested when you don't take 100, but 10,000, 100,000, let's say from 1 to 100. And uh, the microstate means to say, <coughs> means, we, is a description in which you say whether particle one is here or there, particle two is here or there, particle three is here or there, and that's it. That's a microscopic description. Clear to everybody? I was clear enough? Okay. So you describe the microstate by a vector, one to n, and the entries of this vector can be just, you can call it zero and one. Put zero if it's on the left, and one if it's on the right. The totality of these points form phase space for this system. Now, as a macroscopic variable, you may take y is a function of a microstate. Which function? The number of particles that are on the right. And that is easy to get from this coding because just you sum on the whole xi. Now you have to do a dynamics. A dynamics <coughs> could be defined in the following way. Okay, I said 100 particles. Now you take a bag, put 100 numbers inside this bag. I mean, you put a piece of paper with the numbers from 1 to 100. Start with uh, any initial state you want. For instance, all the particles on the left. Now, take your bag, pick up one piece of paper, then you see a number, you look, you, want, you want to look for the particle that has this number, okay, and you put the particle on the other side. Then you take your number, you put it again back in the bag. And you continue like that. Now, at time t equal to zero, the time is discrete here, one particle will go for sure on the other side. Now, time one. 
time one. Well, high chance is that another particle will go there, but uh, see, there is a small chance that the one that was there will be picked up again. Now, if you reason very intuitively and you say, oh, what will happen after some time? I mean, you do this iteration for many, many, many times. And you started with all the particles on the left. What will happen after a long time? Not too long, but let's say long. Some suggestion after two, two days of entropy? <laughs> eh? Yeah. Right. That, that uh, is what will happen. You can even show mathematically that. It's not that trivial like it seems, but you can show this is an example of a Markov chain. And you can show exactly that. And uh, here the macro states are just uh, specifying the number of particles that are on the right. You have a partition of phase space like we had before. And uh, here you have uh, a way to, to compute, again, very simply, the entropy. The entropy is just, uh, this means uh, the number of, now I'm just, you, you are counting. So the number of points that are in the macro states, by simple combinatorial, combinatorial reasoning, this is just uh, n over nu. And then uh, you have uh, Boltzmann entropy for this case. And uh, if you now just use the Stirling approximation for the binomial coefficient, you basically get that the equilibrium entropy is log 2 to the n. That means if you do a, a very normal approximation, you don't even see uh, the non-equilibrium points. You see that the uh, yeah, you see in which sense the, the, the equilibrium is uh, uh, very big, incredibly big. I mean, if you do some approximation, you don't even see the points that are not in equilibrium because you get the equilibrium point are basically the totality of states. Now, since time is running, maybe I, I, I prepare another example, but uh, I. I think I skip it. This is another model uh, that can be analyzed mathematically in a very precise way. And uh, you get the, 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 the Boltzmann equation for this system. Now you get the Boltzmann equation for the Herrenfest model. What is this model? Just, I just describe it. I don't go into the detail. Not at all. It's a model. <coughs> The, the model I described before was stochastic. I mean, was ran, there was some randomness. Even though that randomness did not play any big role, you can think instead of using a bag, you use a generator of uh, random numbers, which is a deterministic machine. So that's and, uh, and that uh, the dynamics in the proper sense is reversible of the one that I described before. Now, this is a bit easier to see the reversibility of this model uh, because it's a deterministic model. You take a ring. Katz was a great probabilist of the 20th century. He worked a lot on the mathematics of statistical mechanics. Now, take a ring and then uh, divide the ring in uh, n points. P1, P2, Pn, and they are the same distance. So that means like, uh, like a watch like a, a clock there. Now, uh, put on, uh, and then uh, between the points, put uh, a ball. The ball can be white or black. Now, put a cross on some of these points, some of the hours, put a cross. And the rule is this one. The system moves uh, counterclockwise, or the other way, doesn't matter. And uh, when a ball 
across a market point, change colors. And the question is similar to a question you asked before. Suppose you start in a very special state. For instance, all the particles are white. What will happen after some time? A sufficiently long time and not too long. Analyzing the model, you get the same answer as before. You get uh, an equidistribution of black and white. You can solve it. You can get uh, the Boltzmann equation for this model. For instance, the, a variable describing the number of uh, white balls or the difference between the white balls and the black balls. And here are just uh, some, uh, some, let's see, just this one. Some computer simulation. This is, <coughs> you have, uh, for this, this system is for, this, why I like this system? Because this system is, uh, doesn't fulfill any of the requirement that people usually ask to, uh, to ground uh, statistical mechanics. Uh, this system is far from the ergodic. It's a periodic system. So it doesn't have uh, any of the nice properties that people once, and some of them still think that uh, a system should have in order that to justify the, uh, the method of ensemble. Here you have that, uh, of course, everything depends on the number of particles you use. The system is periodic. That means uh, here I, I put it only one part of evolution. If I, the here is plotted actually a full evolution. That means here there are all these are uh, paths followed by the system, and uh, and then the system will go back. Here there will be the zero is the equilibrium. It's when there are half white, half 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 black. Now if the time is not too long and the time is related to the number of particles, then you see a, 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 an arrow of time. You see that the system that initially started all white, then they become half white and half black. If the time is too long, then this is a periodic system, then you get completely anti-thermodynamic oh, behavior. Yeah. What, what? These are plotted the trajectories. Uh, in, in, uh, this is the time, and these are the number of particles. This is, for instance, a situation which you start with all, with 400, which are white. And so in the course of time, the, uh, this, this number is decreasing and reaching zero. I mean, the variable that is used, the zero means just you look at the, then at the difference between the white and the red. And, and, the, and the black. What is in black is the Boltzmann solution. And these are the actual true trajectories. Yeah, yeah, do, you, you see that the approximation is not so good. But uh, as everything has to do with the number of particles. As soon as you increase the number of particles, you basically see a total monotomic behavior. So that means you have a complete relaxation to equilibrium. But of course, in a time span, which is not too long, because then the system is periodic, and then at a certain point you go back. So this model is good to appreciate uh, the work of Boltzmann, because here you can, the mathematics is totally under control. It's not completely easy. I mean, but it's easy enough for a, for, a, for a bright student, for a student that is interested in uh, learning not only the conceptual side, but also the technical side, I think. OK. I, I, I don't mention easy model, OK? Now, why I spend some time in, uh, one reason is what I just said. is. Uh, it's always good to be concrete, to try to learn what is going on in simple models. But that is what uh, I wanted to draw a bit of a moral, no? That's, which is on, on the slide. We, we say that uh, the analysis of Boltzmann is difficult, is complicated, is incomplete, was proven finally. Uh, 
hundred years after Boltzmann, so, and was proved in a, in, a, I mean, in, a, in, in, a, in a certain situation, and it, it was, it's really a difficult mathematical theorem. Now, in physics, we always proceed like that. We, we cannot, there are, it would be nice uh, to be able to derive irreversible behavior, to derive the right equations for very complicated systems, derive in the strict mathematical sense, but this is beyond our mathematical ability. It's not just a question of having big brains, it's just beyond. So, and in physics, that's why we use models. Models are good, they're not bad. Models give us an idea of what is going on. When you read that uh, finally we have an explanation of the Anaximenes problem. The Anax Anaximenes problem was the phase transition, water turning into ice and, and, and vapor. We don't actually have an explanation for the realistic system describing molecules of water moving in a vessel. We have it and it's still incomplete for the easing model that I was for, so the for models are incredibly um, far, in a sense, from the real situation, but they capture a lot of, uh, of the true situation. And for this model, we have uh, some understanding in some situations. And uh, indeed, I mean, this is uh, something that once we observed with Shelley and Roderick to Mulca, maybe we even wrote it somewhere, I don't remember, I think so. Uh, Indeed, we don't have too many tools to proceed. One is to, since this is really beyond our grasp, models, or try to get uh, typicality results, namely, try to get results with typical Hamiltonians. And it's a game that was started by Wigner, studying complicated spectra of, uh, of nuclei. 70 years ago. I think he got even the Nobel Prize for that, but I'm not sure that he got it for that. And, uh, and, uh, and this I only mentioned in passing, and some work that we did of convergence to equilibrium in the quantum case uh, was exactly using this strategy to use typical Hamiltonians. Pardon? You get some information. You get uh, uh, the first part is is out. We cannot do that. It's really beyond, except in very simple systems. And uh, and I understand what you say. I mean, since it's allow us to be something precise, not something random. But uh, okay, try a random and see what happened. That is easy to, at least it's easy to analyze, to get some results. Maybe you, you get two good results, like I think Shari was saying yesterday. Two Do good results. Do you have No. No. No, no, I forgot to pick it up, no. No, you, you, yeah, you pick an Hamiltonian that is generic. Well, I, I, I Random. That's sort of the point. You want, you, you want to, if you, you plan to make a computer model of the
properties don't vary too much, so the average is going to be what the, what the typical would have. And yeah. No, but uh, yeah, yeah, but Norman did for 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 Rondo and Tony, no. No, no, we know it. We know, but we 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 write it on the blackboard, and then what we do with that? We we don't have a handle on the equation of motions. On the solutions of equations. The mathematics is much more tractable, yeah. sure. No, no, the mathematics is, if as soon as you say random, the mathematics is much more tractable. It's the realistic one. When you put, uh, I don't know, the, the Coulomb interaction, all that, 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 what do you do? I mean, physics developed a lot of perturbations, made us, whatever, but still, you know, we don't know really what to do if you have to tackle a fine issue like convergence equilibrium, phase transitions. Yes, Tim? Yeah, but you may lose some features which, which are physically relevant. I mean, going to the, to the typical Hamiltonian, you may lose some features. You, you may lose some. For instance, the conservation, you lose the conservation but laws, which are very essential. Very generic, typical features, and what you can get out of that, you understand better that it comes out of that rather than out of the details. No. But when we did that, we were not so negative. Of course, we thought it was something good to do. Yeah. But as to be properly, here I, I put emphasis on the negative side, because if you are not in the field, you have always the impression when we say in physics, oh, we prove this and this and this, then I, this was mostly for philosopher students. It's not true. I mean, we, we don't prove that. I mean, our mathematical abilities are very low. We, we are not able to. We do approximation. You, we do tricks. We are still in a situation, T take ferromagnetism. Ferromagnetism is, is more or less understood with the easing model. But an essential component of ferromagnetism is that it is in a metal. Well, the electrons are moving. And uh, the easing model they are completely, is a completely rigid structure. So we capture an aspect of a, of a, of a, of a phenomenon, the, the magnetization. But we don't have a good understanding of uh, of the two things, to conductivity, whatever is happening in, in, in a metal. But Daniel, you do agree that Quinn is right in, in pointing out this positive aspect of the 
No, I agree. I explained why I did negative. That's why I said we did it in that paper explaining why. No, I agree completely. I already told him. I said, just explain why I made it negative here. Just to be philosophy, students of philosophy to know that when the physicists say, oh, this is true, it's not true. I mean, we, we can do less. And one should appreciate these facts. That means we have to develop, develop a lot of strategies like this one to really get a handle on a problem. In this sense, it's positive because we develop certain uh, strategy that are explana still explanatory. So, no, no, explanatory. Yes? Then my question is what we call an effective Hamiltonian. I mean, your scheme was better realistic or a typical Hamiltonian? In which scheme? In which, which line? First? Say, there is something called an effective Hamiltonian, okay, which can be derived to describe a certain phenomenon as a kind of callback of the envelope expression of an idea, okay? Yeah. No, no, no. Here, here, don't call it effective. This is just a typical, That's generic, a typical. typical, generic. That means okay. anyone. Okay. That was the method of Wigner. Okay. Effective is when you take the realistic and you and you just squeeze it and you make some approximation. You get an effective description. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Okay. So effective is the first one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the first one is realistic. I say one way is, is to. From a reali yeah, I mean, realistic, then you do some ex approximation, like, I don't know, Artry Fock. Where do you put I keep asking you your classification. I don't have it in my, I don't have it. But does it belong to the realistic or to the typical category? That's what I'm asking. You need a third category. No, I need, you need more. You mean that I, I, I say it in words. I say starting from realistic, one, one strategy is to try to make approximation. And I didn't put the dot. And the effective Hamiltonians are of this kind. Then there are possibilities of just using models. Also, the models are more or less obtained by doing approximation on a realistic model. No, the easing model is somehow arising from sort of approximation you make. But then at the end of the day, you have a model in front of you, a well-defined model. And then you try to work it out. Yeah, so the middle is exactly what it's expected. Yeah. More details on what? How you construct your typical Hamiltonian. You what what you involves have... in the process of coming up of, of reviewing your typical Hamiltonian? How do you how do you construct it? Ta <coughs> okay, take uh, let's do quantum. Let's go quantum. Uh, the basic uh, Hamiltonian or unitary evolution is more or less the same. Okay, take uh, the Take a finite dimensional system. So you have a unitary transform. You have the evolution is a unitary transformation on a, on a complex uh, space of high dimension. Um, take uh, a random unitary matrix. That means you know a unitary matrix has to do uh, to fulfill some 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 constraints, and then you you put a uniform distribution given these constraints on the set of all unitary matrix, and that you get a random. A random unitary evolution. Almost time to go to lunch. Uh, <clears throat> now, what, what, what really? I mean, now you have to read prove in a weaker sense for Boltzmann, but still is a proof, it's not an argument. It's more than an argument, but it's less than a, a rigorous mathematical proof. Here, Lanford in 1970, you should read proof, but then uh, what I put it here, that means, this is how I summarize the theorem. Low entropy initial states typically evolve into higher entropy state for all practical purposes. I use just the, the language that Tim used the first day. Now, this is not a fair summary of Lanford theorem. Like Shell is emphasizing many times, only the statement of a theorem is one page long. So we have to be really precise to be, then be able to prove it something. So that is a summary which is uh, more or less capturing what is going on, but uh, too brief for 
a mathematical proof. But it's what, as physicists, we believe is true. That FAP is important, has to do with not, not too long times, or one that the, the picture they showed before, if you go too long, then you get anti-thermodynamic behavior. And the reason is such a difficult theorem, something so difficult to prove, but the reason is, uh, the intuitive reason is simple. Somehow, if you start somewhere here, it's like uh, you are moving in a region with a lot of lakes, and then there is a very big lake that is uh, just covering more or less of the region, very tiny bit of land. And if you walk more or less randomly, you will jump into the water. But how do you say, how can you make precise a statement that the lake is big? In a dilute gas, you can have a, a proof of what I said before, that the volume of a, of a macro state is big. Very big. It's almost covering the full energy surface. I mean, <coughs> But again, an, an intuitive, the proof tells you everything. The proof of Lamford tell, should satisfy anyone that look for precision and rigor. I'm just giving the heuristic. And the heuristic is, is the one that I gave over the lake. Now, of course, if you, move, if you move very, very, very carefully, you might avoid the water. But there are less paths doing that then the path that leads you to the water. Yes, Mario? First of all, I put it there because Tim had it. And my idea was to collect ideas that were in the last days. So I should have asked that question to Tim first day. The sentence was evolve into higher entropy states without any qualification. This is the cat's model. Go back to the initial value of entropy. Doesn't evolve until higher states only if you stay here, if your time is not too long. But it's not just a question of typicality with respect to the initial condition. But it's also a question concerning the time scale. Yeah, yeah, Barry. The question that was just asked about the size of the lake. Yeah. Mm. Using the measure that you're appealing to, the lake is really, really big. Yeah. But as David emphasized in the previous talk, there are lots and lots of measures that extend how, how many. No, but. I, I thought that so I, I don't know whether you were assuming this is the right measure or you were telling us something about the nature of right. right is a strong word. I would say the, the natural measure. I think David too said the the, 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 the natural measure. Yeah, natural is it's what's used. Hmm. But I wonder if there's something about the world that makes it the right measure. The nature, the measure that gives the right dimension. It, maybe that's just but you want to have what? An a priori argument? Then, then, then David will be upset. It well, can be only a posteriori. I mean, I cannot give you an a priori argument why so this measure is good. You, you might think of it as being a priori, or you might think of it as being a posteriori. No, I think so it's, it's a posteriori, posteriori, like all physics. For yeah, me, well, it's... Why? What is it about the world that makes it the right measure? The answer might be just the system in the place. It's just like the... the I mean, result. this is, uh, is a Velluville measure, the one that David mentioned. And this measure is, uh, is very natural, from a, uh, is an invariant measure, so all the nice properties. But then uh, it's like uh, F equal ma. F equal ma is a nice equation, can be understood from some symmetry principle or whatever, but then at the end of the day, it's only for empirical reasons that I, I just think that the measure, the choice of a measure is, is on the same level as the choice of equation. I, for me, the full theory comes in a package. The package consists of, a, of, a, of equations of motion and also of a measure.
Mm, okay. Sometimes when you press, it feels like you say, no, it's exactly the same as the way I think it was done. Other times, it feels like you want to say a little more. I, you have to say, you, you guys. When I, when I'm growing old. I mean, I'm an old man now, so I. Can I say a little more? Tim, yes. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Go ahead. Tim, you were attributing to me something which it was I know to be much better than I could. <laughs> No. Yeah. So the, calling it the natural measure really is to say that this is the measure that comes up over and over and over and over again in all of our dealings with the natural world, and that to use it here in a new way is the natural thing to do. Thanks, Tim. I really. Yeah. You're <laughs> That's that. Thanks. He wanted to take me. Understood that. Now, I say that I'm growing old because, uh, getting <clears throat> old, because in the past I would have defended that only the first statement. The set of exceptions is small. Typical behavior means this with respect, the set of exceptions is small, incredibly small with respect to the natural measure. Now, if somebody says it occurs with high probability, typical means it occurs with high probability. Would not be my way of saying it, but I don't complain too much. Okay. I don't complain too much because, after all, for me, the only relevant probability are those that are close to zero or one. That's the difference with David. Uh, and it's not me, actually. This was, was a great pro Russian probabilist, was one of the best students of Kolmogorov. And in the uh, Soviet uh, in, uh, Encyclopedia of Mathematics, in the section of probability, in the introduction, he says, only probability close to zero or one at meaningful. And I wish everybody should reflect on that statement. It's an important statement. But, but if like, you were one of the comments from experiment, and like, had like, a cat sitting in some animal, and like, you get to like, have a real point three probability, and then on a pure theory, you measure it, it seems like I confirm that probability is predictable. Clearly, since I'm not crazy, I think that also in that case, the only probability, the only measures which are relevant are those close to one or zero. Only in those cases in which you see. Do you really mean that the only probability is close to zero, one, and meaningful? Yeah, I really mean that. I, basically, it's my life that, okay? <laughs> I gave a talk on this on several occasions to philosophers. I was younger, so I was, uh, I still don't have a good way of defending it, okay? To, to such a lot. But for me, it's one of my strongest belief is that only probability close to zero or one are meaningful. I think you can test your experiment in a different way. What is the, what is the distribution of what comes to that many years? Do you expect the distribution to be 30, 3% at all? And for 
that distribution we also will be equal to one. Right. Yeah. But that's what I'm talking. I'm talking about, about the real world. When somebody says one third, that was my question to David before, is the number that I have here and what I do with that number? The relevant number is what is tested with the law of large numbers. And the law of large numbers concerns events that are uh, probability or measure close to one or to zero. But do, you, do you really think, are you really telling me that lesson is not meaningful? Look, in everyday life, uh, I use probability like you do. I'm talking about something a bit weird, which is a measure on phase space. I found, I'm talking about the role of the probability measure in a fundamental theory about the universe where we have only one universe. So I'm talking about something which is far removed from the normal use of probability. When I do betting, I do like you do. I mean, that's... To, to raise this issue means not to understand that point. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. It's fine. Fine. Conceptual creation. That's all. Right. Fair. Completely fair, Tim. There was Maria before, but I wanted to conclude because I need to go to lunch. <laughs> Mario. Yeah. No, I mean uh, the measure. I mean, so if you call the measure on phase space probability, I mean, I don't, I don't make a fuss out of that. Fine. Exactly. It's called mathematical theory of probability. So fine, no problem. But I'm talking about that object. And I accept that it's empirically meaningful. Of course, there are regions in phase space which have a measure, I don't know, one third. Is that empirically meaningful? For me, no. David would say, yeah, that will help me make my, my, my bet. I mean, if a Croatia winning, if initial condition gave a certain value to that event, a probability, that my epistemic, uh, whatever, my behavior will be decided on the basis of that number. Fine, I mean, nothing to argue. But say, as far as physics is concerned, what is empirically meaningful are those that are close to one or zero. The measure. That's sure. The frequencies. The histograms, but these are measure. They have measure one. The histogram. Physicists do that. Histograms. And then, of course, when I say, still, why I'm not so happy is because indeed, typically, it is a weaker notion. Just basically knows about uh, the measure of small sets and big sets. Doesn't care at all about the value. But okay. And then uh, I finish because, like I said, I want to go to lunch. Uh, I wanted to conclude. I say that even today, uh, <coughs> with uh, I had Feynman a long time ago, and then at the beginning of the talk, I again have Feynman. I, 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 I change subject. I want to go to another aspect. Uh, that is taken from le Feynman lectures notes in physics. Another delight of physics is that even simple and realized things like the ratchet of the pole, don't worry about what they are, is a certain device that Feynman is using to explain the second law. Uh, work only because they are part of the universe. The ratchet of the pole works in only one direction. Think of a heat engine that you have. Think, think, 
just think of any w one direction, a process that is occurring only in one direction in time, because it has some ultimate contact with the rest of the universe. If a ratchet and pole were in a box and isolated for some sufficient time, the wheel would be no more likely to go one way than the other. But because we pull up the shades and let, okay, this has to do with the machinery and let the light out, because we cool off the earth and get heat from the sun, the ratchet and poles that we make can turn one way. This one wayness is interrelated with the fact that that ratchet is part of the universe. It is part of the universe, not only in the sense that it obeys the physical laws, that will be the trivial sense, but this one-way behavior, the one-way behavior, the irreversible behavior is tied to the one-way behavior of the entire universe. It cannot be completely understood until the mystery of the beginning of the history of the universe are reduced still further from speculation to scientific understanding. That's the difficult question. No, just a second. That's the difficult question. Uh, in a paper, Shelley distinguished between the easy part of the problem of reversibility and the hard part. What I discussed so far is the easy part, and that's the hard part, the difficult part. Why do we find system in low entropy state to begin if the state are so unlikely? And that is the connection with the talk of David. David gave an answer to that question, which is an answer that you find given by Feynman, by Boltzmann, is a possible answer to this question. And, uh, I have still little to say, but if you want no, to... I, just, I actually just wanted to... It's a beautiful quote from Feynman. Is that from the character of physical... No, it's uh, from the lecture notes. I love it. It's beautiful quote. It's from the... Something similar is also there. I took it from the, from the lecture notes, but maybe something similar is there. Yeah. And uh, uh, I lost, I wanted to say the last words. That's a very bad ending. No, sorry, let, let me think, let me think. I forgot what I, I wanted to say, just the sentence that I forgot. Okay, now I remember. What do you want to say? So I didn't hear that David answered that question, though there was implicitly an answer. But do you think that David answered this question? I think with the past hypothesis, I would say that is an answer to this question. Why is it an answer? That is, why don't you say why the HF hypothesis is the claim that the universe was in a very low entropy condition? No, the question. Why don't you no, say? No, 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 no. No, yeah, 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 it's clear that question. No? I have an explanation that look, before the easy part tells you that low entropy states go into higher entropy states. So the natural tendency is to go into higher entropy states. So the question is why do we have around us so many low entropy states? And the past hypothesis is providing an answer to I that. See, but, but it's not an answer to the question of why they have hypothesis. No, 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 no. It's an answer to this question. To this question. And I wanted to conclude saying that maybe there are other answers. I think it's a physical problem. It's not a philosophical issue. Maybe there are other possibilities. And uh, if you remember, a long time ago, I, I stressed the point of view of, of uh, Cullen on thermodynamics. And, uh, uh, and then later on, I went into the description in terms of energy, volume. But uh, when we study the universe as a whole, or part of that cluster of galaxies, whatever, there are, this first of all is an unbounded space. And volume doesn't need to be the correct one, a good variable, good macroscopic variable. And uh, you may have, other variables, it means you can construct the thermodynamics for unbounded systems. I think still there is some work to be done, which, uh, for instance, will uh, solve 
some of the classical problems. You find in the books that as soon as you have gravity, everything is ill-defined, everything clumps together, there is no possibility of doing statistical mechanics. Now, I want to refer to a recent paper by Dustin, who is there, in which they approach this, exactly this issue, the issue of whether uh, one can uh, analyze uh, systems in a, in a different way and good, a good entropy uh, function, which is uh, um, more or less uh, giving us hope that we may have uh, an explanation of, uh, an answer to the last question without using the past hypothesis. This is related also to uh, uh, a work of Chen and Carroll of some years ago. But what recently Dustin and Power did was to use classical gravity instead of a, of, of, of a very idealized model. And using as a thermodynamic variables, not the volume, but let's say the, uh, for the size, I think you use the moment of inertia, no? Dustin. And this bridge, it, there is a bridge between this and uh, uh, the approach of Barbour uh, and, and collaborators. Uh, that means uh, in, in a framework of uh, completely relational mechanics, where again, there is hope there that maybe if uh, our basic laws are, are very relational, I, I, don't ent I don't say more than that, I mean, I don't, I really believe so, but it's not, then we may also have uh, an understanding of uh, an answer to the last question, which does not require the past hypothesis. End of the talk, everybody to lunch before, but before I will answer questions, I don't want to stop anybody. I, I finish. No, <laughs> lunch time. Okay, 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 fine. I don't want to influence anybody. Because of the picture that you made. You made that picture, no? Right. That means the entropy, there is a sort of central time, and then the entropy is increasing in both directions. Okay, so then in, uh, then there is no, no, then you already have that a certain time in the past, the universe was in a low entropy state. It might not be low enough. No, sure, there can be a lot, but that, that was, is a ridiculous model, just three particles. That's why I was, making some commercial for a model which is using gravity. Uh, like if you're not at the same time, if you're somewhere like yeah. the branches, then how do you not get past that model progressively? Because all the trajectories in that model behave in the term correct way. There is an increase of entropy from the center of time to the future and to the past. But, 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 no. yeah, but, but the question is, past, past hypothesis means our universe started in a low, very low entropy state that was good for creating everything that was needed. That, that's the past hypothesis. Uh, in that model, you don't have to supplement the physical laws with this additional law. This, this, Feynman would consider that an additional law. There are a law of physics and there is an additional law, which is this one. In that model, you don't have to put this additional law. It's just a fact. It's, you know, it's, 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 a it's, it's, it's true, but it was a scale to it. It's not a fundamental action. Right. Of course it's true, yeah, but. That's the point. It, you don't have to have it as a fundamental action. It can be a
And, and what they're hoping in this model is that the way the multiverse keeps from facial dissociation is by boiling off new baby generations, which are for some reason that they haven't explained, typically born in what are for them very low density states. So actually, you don't, you're not going to be less predictive in their model by going all the way back to the minimum of the entropy of the multiverse. You're going to be going back to the birth of the baby universe that you're in. And they're hoping, I mean, they say very little about how this would work, but I agree with Dino that it would be nice if something like that did work. Um, um, what they're hoping is that the dynamics are such that the way the multiverse increases its entropy is by constantly giving birth to baby universes, each of which goes back to very low And that there are going to be dynamical reasons for <coughs> Yeah, yeah, within that's different. To the birth of new subsystems exactly. within our universe. And no, there's an argument that you don't. There's an argument that if you take the uniform probability distribution over a subsystem, conditionalize that on the fast hypothesis, it'll still give the conditionalization won't have any effect on the predictions that it makes for the future. And I think that'll be sufficient also within that universe to do the rest of the assumption. So I, I see why you raised the question. Okay, but this is no, different. I think that just if things work out the way they want, they're all different. Okay. Shall we close the session? Okay. Thank you.